next two songs we're going to sing is I Surrender All and I Give Myself Away. Um, and, you know, when you, when you surrender, that's when you throw your hands up and you, you realize, that's it. I can't do it anymore. I'm not on my own. I can't do this on my own anymore. I've got to have somebody else. Um, when you fully surrender to a cop or whatever, you're, you're, not in their, you're not in your own control anymore. You're in someone else's control now. Or, you know, that might be a bad example right now in this day and age. But when you throw your hands up, that's the act of surrenderance. I'm done. And, you know, we can't do things on our own in life. Um, we've got to surrender all to him. And when we're, when we're kicking and fighting and screaming and, and, and fussing about something or anxiety or worry or fear or whatever, it's, 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 we're not fully surrendered then because we're not in, in his control. We're under, partly under our own control. We've got one foot in and one foot out. We're partly, we want him to be, we want to be surrendered to him, but we're not fully surrendered to him. And so this morning, um, I give myself away is a song that talks about, we give you all of our life, all of our plans, our heart, our dreams, because our life is not our own. It's his. And so this morning, I want us to throw our hands up and be surrendered to him and just say, Lord, here I am. I give myself away to you.
that. Psalm chapter 128. This psalm was written to men. Now the first verse may not seem evident in that, but this psalm, but you'll see as we read through, this psalm was definitely written to men. And so today I want to speak to the men. And just like we did on Mother's Day, I think some of the others could could get, you'll get something out of this today, I'm sure. Hopefully, uh, if the Lord would use me this morning, that everybody will get something out of this before we leave. Um, but I want to spend some time talking to our men today. Whether you're a father or not, uh, you're our man, godly example for um, our children. And uh, we, we want, I want to bless you this morning with this word. Psalm chapter 128. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as fr a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. This is an example of a good father, a good man. In Psalm 128, and this man could not be that way if it wasn't for verse 1. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. He got his example from the first father. So this morning I want to talk to you about that father and the example he is for us. I want to talk to you about the founding father. The founding father. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for your blessing on your word this morning. We pray that you will anoint the ears of all those that would speak, Lord. Today is a practical message, Lord, and you know that. And I feel like you've given it to me. But, Lord, I pray that each one of us could take something out of here and use it, Father, for your glory to be closer to you, be closer to the Heavenly Father, our Founding Father. And we'll give you praise, we'll give you glory for it, Lord. Anoint my lips to speak what you would have me to say this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Founding fathers. When we hear that term, we generally think of, and what historians call, especially in the United States, we think of men who were instrumental in forming our country. More specifically, in writing the Declaration of Independence, or in helping in writing the Constitution. We, we generally lump the people that we consider to be founding fathers in that, in that area around the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Now, it's interesting to see that our country today is doing its best. A lot of the people in our country are doing their best to eliminate that history. To eliminate any, any thought of what the Founding Fathers did for our country. Uh, that were they perfect? Absolutely not. As I said before, none of us are. Were they, were they, did they do everything the right way? Absolutely not. But these men started something in our nation that it seems that we are trying to run away from as quickly as possible. Not we, but a lot of people are. And this thing has lasted for years on end. Centuries now, this constitution that we have, these found the ideas of our founding fathers, and now it seems that we've found a better way in a lot of people's eyes. I'm glad for some of the things that have changed since they, uh, they have the Constitution. I'm glad that we no longer have slavery in our country. I'm glad that women have rights in our country. I'm glad that we have made those, those changes to our Constitution. And we have done those with, with prayer and we have done those with the leadership of God Almighty. But the problem is today in our society is where we're led by the wisdom and by the knowledge of man, if you can call it that, instead of being led by the wisdom of our founding father. And our founding father was not George Washington. It was not, uh, it was not Ben Franklin. It, our, our founding father was God Himself. Yeah. Right. And if we're not led, men, if we're not led, women, 
If we're not led, teenagers and children, if we're not led by the Father Himself, then everything we do is in vain. Today I want to talk to you about what that means to be a founding father. And what it means to live under His example based on Psalm 128. Some people would define founding fathers. One historian says it's a, it's a wide range of extraordinary people who initiated, initiated a revolutionary process. One, another historian says a better approach might be to include all men and women who gave of themselves, even in some cases, life itself in supporting the cause of liberty. I thank God that our Father sent His Son to die for us and give up His life so that we could have freedom. Another said the common thread was that they were all treasonous rebels who put their lives and fortunes on the line for the cause. They put their lives on, and, and their treasonous might alarm you that I would say that, but I'm going to tell you that we were all serving Satan at one time. We were all, we were all going after the things of the flesh, but we have, we have gone away from, we have rebelled against Him, and we are serving God now, and because of that, we should give our lives up for the cause. We give our lives away. I give myself away. I surrender all to you. See, when we say those words, that's what those words were written to mean. That we are actually giving all to Him. I had a pastor one time, Brother William McCarty, that used to say that some of you, that when you sing that song, you, would, you should be saying, I surrender some because that's really what you mean. That's kind of harsh when you first hear it, but it's the truth. And it? Because some of us know, Lord, I surrender all except for that one thing I'm going to do when I leave here. I surrender all except for that one thought. I'm not ready to get rid of that. I'm not ready to get one of the, rid of that one hurt. I surrender all to you. But, but we serve a Father who wants all. We serve a Father who lived as an example that would die and give up his life for all. Dictionary.com when you look up founding fathers says a person who founds or establishes an important institution. Webster Dictionary says an originator of an institution or movement. God established an institution when he created Eve. God established the family when he created Eve. He is the founding father. He created that institution that we call family. He created that institution that we call marriage. The enemy has tried to destroy the family for years and he will continue to do that. One of the biggest attacks that is on our country right now is to attack the home. If we can split up the home, we can split up the strength of the family. If we want to change the way we do things in our nation, then we'll split up the way that a family was designed to be. We'll get rid of traditional marriage. We won't, we won't have an importance in that. It's a shame when we live in a country, I don't mean this to be a political message, but it's a shame when we live in a country where people are scared to get marriage because they'll lose their benefits. Where we have set up a system where we're keeping people from being formed in a, in a union together in a family. It's important that we have a family structure because God designed it that way. If the destruction of the family is the number one priority of the enemy, then the defense of the family ought to be our number one priority. If you are doing what you are supposed to do, then everything around you is going to be blessed. If men are you being, if you're being led by the Father, then everything around us is going to be blessed. Verse 1 tells us, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his way. What is our first responsibility? Our first responsibility is to make sure we're okay. Our first responsibility is to make sure that we're in the right relationship with God. You can't help anybody else if you're not doing right. 
You can't help anybody else if you're not living for God with everything you have. Why is it important for every father in this place to sing that song with me, to surrender everything they have to him? Because if we're not surrendering all to God, we can't expect our family to do that. We are the head of our home. Thank God for the fathers as I'm looking across here today. Thank God for the fathers that have brought their children to the house of God. Thank God for the fathers who have over years and years have done what they can to serve God. Thank God for you that have feared God and have lived for Him. And because of that, you see the fruit of your labor. A lot of you have, some of you have adult children in this room right now because of what you have done and the, the, the hours that you have spent. There are women in this room that had to be the father when the father wasn't. And because of you, your, your children are sitting in this room. Your, some of your grandchildren are sitting in this room because you have, you have done what you can to serve God with all your heart and you've been an example. We must walk in His ways. We must fear Him. Our family cannot be led in the way God designed. If, it's led, if, if it is led, can only be led. Our family can only be led in the way that God designs if it is led by a godly man who fears the Lord and walks in His ways. That is no, that is nothing against mothers. But the way that God designed it is not for single parents to lead homes. The way that God designed, designed it is that a man and a woman would come together and they would have children and they would lead their children in the way and that the father would be the one who would lead the home. Job 1.5 says, And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, talking about the children, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this is the, this is the part I want you to hear. Thus did Job continually. Men, if we're going to lead our homes, then we have to be men of prayer. We have to be men of worship. We have to be men who are... It's okay that we do other things for our house. It's okay that we provide. We should do that. The Scripture tells us that in Psalm 128 as well. But, but, but the most important thing we can do is cover our home spiritually. Amen. The most important thing we can do as men of God is to make sure that we're praying for our wives, praying for our children, praying for our household, and, and showing them how to worship. Teaching them in the ways of the Lord. <coughs> Verse 2, he begins to talk about that work. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy thou shalt be, and it shall be well with thee. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. I'll read that scripture to condemn you. I read that scripture to commend each and every one of you who have worked hard to provide for your home. Amen. That you are doing what God has called you to do. That you, are, that you are leading your children as an example of a man of God that will work and that will provide for their house. And one day, some of your sons could do the same. And some of your daughters will have that instilled in them to do the same for their home. Amen. There is joy in knowing that you are working or have worked for everything you get. God made us men to desire to provide for our wives and our children. Now I know there's some of you that are retired and there's some of you that don't work as much as you used to because you put in your time. You've done what you can to raise your children. We thank God for you too. It's not condemnation for you here. There comes a time when we have to retire. We have to slow down a little bit. But until that time, we need to be working and providing for our homes. It says, because of that, in the last part of that verse, it says, it, happy shall thou be, and it shall be well with thee. What that means is right now you're happy because you're working, you're providing for your home, but later on you're going to be happy because you're going to see the fruit of your labor. You're going to see the children. You're going to see uh, your wife and, and, and your children being blessed because of what you have done now and the work that you have put forward. 
Then he moves on to talk about the wife and the marriage. He says, Thy wife shall be a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy wife shall be a fruitful vine. We learned a lot about the vine this morning in Sunday school. We learned a lot about what the vine is. And the Bible says, The wife shall be a fruitful vine. Men, the moment you asked her to marry you, you were establishing an institution. An institution of family. When you said I do, you are agreeing or to leading that institution and to make sure that institution was successful. The number one calling as a man of God, if you're a married man of God, your number one calling is to your wife. If you are doing what you are supposed to do, then your wife will be productive and your wife will be fruitful. In order for a vine to produce fruit, it must first clean. You have to fasten and tie it to a post for security. We provide a place, men, a place of security for our wives that she can clean in order for her to grow a man who fears the Lord will lead his wife closer in a relationship with God. Men, hear me. You should not be hindering your you, you should not be hindering your wife's walk with God. You should be strengthening your wife's walk with God. That is our first calling as a husband. Is to make sure our wife grows in the Lord. Does she have some responsibility in that? Absolutely, but God has left her in your care to lead her and direct her in the ways of the Lord. I know this ain't a shouting service. I didn't expect nobody to run the aisles this morning. But I want to help you this morning. And I want to preach to myself a little bit too, if you don't mind. Because I, I, we all could grow in that area. We all could do more to help our wives. We all could lead in devotions more. We all could pray more for our spouses. We all could do that. Now, our, our tendency is to complain about them a lot. But if we do what we're supposed to do, then we'll see a fruitful vine. A man who fears the Lord will leave his wife closer. Ecclesiastes 9, 9. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life. Of, of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and thy labor which thou taketh under the sun. It says, Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of our life. He did not create Eve. I want you to hear this. And y'all heard this before, but I want to remind you. He did not create Eve out of Adam's foot. He didn't create that. That means. That you shouldn't be walking all over your wife. You don't rule your wife. She's not your servant. I want the women to hear this, men. He didn't, he didn't create Eve out of the top of his skull either. And the wife shouldn't be trying to control the husband and everything he does either. Amen. Oh, man, I got some amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> But he created Eve. Somebody woke up. He created Eve out of his side. Amen. He created Eve out of his ribs. What does that mean? That means that he planned from the beginning. God could have created Eve out of anything. He could have created Eve out of dust and ground too. But he was trying to show us his plan for marriage. And he was showing us that she should walk beside him. She should be his helpmate. She's helping him. He's helping her. And they're, 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 they're leading each other and they're helping each other to grow in the Lord constantly. She is to walk beside you. That means you're supposed to help her. She's supposed to help you. And when we do that, we're going to see our wives Grow. We're going to see people, our families grow in the Lord. And God has called us to do that. Yes. Then he says in the last part of verse 3, he says, Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. You got married and then you start, then you decided you were going to bring, well some of you decided, some of you were surprised and brought other people into this institution of family. 
You had children. And then your responsibilities grew. But as the father of this institution, you must make sure that the legacy continues after you're gone. Yeah. Proverbs 27 says, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. You see, it, 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 likens, it likens the children to an olive plant. An olive plant, if nurtured correctly, will grow into an olive tree that can produce olives. Listen to this. For over 2,000 years, some olive trees have produced olives. Over 2,000 years. What's the coincidence that the psalmist wrote this in this psalm because what he's trying to tell you is if you'll be the father you're supposed to be and God bless you with these children and you'll lead them the way that you're supposed to lead them and you'll take the example of the founding father and you'll allow God to lead you so that you can lead them. If you'll do that then your children will prosper for years and their grandchildren will prosper and their great grandchildren will prosper and throughout the centuries they will prosper because you have done what you can to serve God to the best of your ability and to serve your family with the best of your ability. It doesn't just end there. See, the work you're doing is causing other things to happen than just your kids getting through school. It's causing other things to happen than you just feeding your kids today. The time that you spend with your children is causing a legacy to happen right. where people can be affected. Just think about this. If your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, if they all serve God because of an example that you have given in your home, how many people will they reach for the gospel of Jesus Christ? How many people will be pulled out of hell and be heaven, living eternity in heaven because you became the man of God that God had called you to be and lead your home? We have a huge responsibility as a father. And I know sometimes on Father's Day we hear all these things and it's like, oh my goodness, I feel overwhelmed now. But let me tell you, it is rewarding to be a father because we can see the fruits of our labor. And even the labor and the fruits that we don't see, we know that God is going to bless it because the scripture tells us to. They're going to be like olive trees. Yes, amen. They're going to continue to bear fruit. We are that example of a true founding father. What kind of God the Heavenly Father, are our children learning about through us? You might be here today and say, I've never had the example of a father myself. My father wasn't there for me, so I don't really have that example, so I don't know how to be a father, really. I don't know what to do. Some of you would never say that out loud, but you live your life every day confused about what to do as a father. But let me tell you, one of the greatest things you can do, and this is from a father myself before, let me tell you, in my opinion, one of the greatest things that you can do as a father is just be there. That's right. Just be there. That's right. Just be there. Charles Francis Adams, he was the grandson of our second president, John Adams. Of course, he had children of his own. And they went back and looked at his diary. And one day in his diary, he had entered these words. Went fishing with my son today, a day wasted. His son, Brooke Adams, had his own diary, and he went back to the same day that he wrote that, and his son wrote these words in that diary. Went fishing with my father, the most wonderful day of my life. God, never take for granted the time that you spend for you, with your children. That's right. What? Your children will love every minute that you spend with them and you don't understand the impact that you're having on your children when you spend time with them. The greatest thing we can do is spend time with them. There are three types of people. Those who had a father who was present in the home. Those who had a father in the home but was never really present. And those who did not have a father in the home at all. Those who didn't have a father that was present have more trouble understanding who God is than anyone else. Because you have a trouble, you have trouble relating the Father, the Heavenly Father. Yeah. One out of four children in America do not have a father in the home. They're four times greater risk of poverty, seven times more likely to be pregnant as a teen. Eighty-five percent of youth in prisons came from fatherless homes. And those without a father in the home are two times more likely to drop out of high school. 
Those who had a father present relate God to, relate God to how their fathers treated them. But those who didn't have a father at all have a hard time even comprehending the Heavenly Father. They need us to be that example. Does that mean they can't, they can't succeed? No. These are just statistics. God breaks statistics every day. God ruins statistics every day. And God can redeem anyone. But we have to, I'd say those statistics to help you understand the impact, not so you can see the bad, but to see the good that you're having on your children because you're in the home and you're serving God and you're living for God and you're being the father that you should be. Men, we must show our children who God is. Someone was said up to 15 years old. They do what they tell. They do what you tell them to do, and after 15, they do what you show them to do. They will see him through our love for them. Children, you're not going to like this, but our love causes us to discipline you at times. Proverbs 23 says, "Without not correction." From, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beateth him with the rod, he shall not die. That's right. It's not going to kill you. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. I'd rather be punished than to live a life in hell. Thank God for the couple of spankings I got when I was a kid. Thank God for parents who understood when John needs to learn to keep his mouth shut. I know that's hard to believe. That's why I got in trouble most of the time. But I just didn't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I may or may not have gotten a backhand when I was in the back seat of the car one time. And understood not to back talk my mom again. <laughs> we should correct our children. We should discipline our children. But never in anger. Never in anger but only in love. Three things I think that as men we should know we should do with our kids. Number one, we should correct them. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Scripture tells you, that's a hard scripture to read, but if, if, if a daddy doesn't discipline their kids, the Bible says you hate them. If you really loved them, you would discipline them so that they would do right. That's not my word. Don't get mad at me. That's not my word. That's, that's the word of God. The second is communication. We should teach our children. It's important how to it's important to know why you are being corrected. It's important to communicate that with our children. And it's important to teach them through the things that they have done that's wrong. Use those as teaching. Times. We've had to do that recently in our home. It's just to teach them. Send them out and tell them why the things they did were wrong and to teach them how to do right. Ephesians 6, 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. A lot of times we let the wife do the nurture. But the Bible says a father should do the nurture too in the teaching of the Lord. Deuteronomy 4, 9, But teach them, not thy sons, and thy sons' sons. Deuteronomy 6, 7, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. He's talking about the law. A young man was to be sentenced by the penitentiary, by, to the penitentiary. The judge had known him from childhood, for he was well acquainted with his father. He was a famous legal scholar and the author of an exhaustive study entitled The Law of Trust. So the judge wanted to prick his heart before he sentenced him. He said, do you remember your father? I remember him well, your honor, came the reply. Then trying to probe the offender's conscience, the judge said, as you are about to be sentenced, and as you think of your wonderful dad, what do you remember most clearly about him? There was a pause. Then the judge received an answer he hadn't expected. I remember when I went to him for advice, he looked up at me from the book he was writing and said, Run along, boy. I'm busy. When I hit, went to him for companionship, he turned to me, he turned me away, saying, Run along, son. This book must be finished. Your Honor, you remember him as a great lawyer. I remember him as a lost friend. The magistrate muttered to himself, Alas, finish the book, but lost the boy. 
Fathers, I know we're busy. We love, we love work, but take time from your work to talk to your kids. Take time from your work to teach your children. And the third thing besides communication and correction is compassion. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But this is the last part of that scripture. But he that loveth him chasteneth him the times on occasion when he needs it. Some of you might say, I got a whipping every week whether I need it or not. <laughs> I didn't live up that kind. I didn't live in that kind of home. But maybe it does some people some good. But it says on occasion when they need it, you got to chasten them if you love them. They need to know the love of the founding father. And he's relying on us men to show that to them. He's relying on the mothers to do that too. But today I'm speaking to the men. He wants us to show the love of the father to our children. The first picture of the love of God that our children have comes from our fathers. Don't miss that opportunity. If you look at it as a responsibility, you won't do it with love. But if you look at it as an opportunity, right. you'll love to do it. Yes. If you'll look at it as the fruit that's going to come out of it, you'll love to do it. We get so busy. I'm, I'm guilty of that. We get so busy, we get focused on the job. And some of you probably see that. Because I sometimes you'll come to church, and I probably don't shake your hand right away. Or I don't smile at you right away. Because I'm focused on what I need to do. And I've got to remind myself to take time. It's not that I don't love you. But what good is love if we don't show it? It's not that you don't love your children if you haven't done those things, but what good is love if we don't show it? Let's love our children. And then I'm going to quickly do this. But behold, thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Verse 5, the Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of of thy life. Jerusalem, Zion there, is related to the church today. It represents the church today. The good of the church comes through men who will lead. Right. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Thank God for women who have filled in the gaps where men have failed to fill in time and time again in our churches across America. But thank God for men who will stand up. And God wants men to stand up and to fight the good fight as we talked about earlier. God wants men of God to lead the way and to show us what we should do and what the Father would have us do as we serve God together and lead the church into where He wants the church to be. Thank God for those men who will sacrifice their time. Men who will be the fathers that God has called them to be. Men who will carry on the work of the founder of the church, Jesus Christ. The chief cornerstone. The founder of His church. And then in verse 6 it tells us, Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. Every grandparent in this house, your work does not stop with the children. And you know that. Your work gets a little bit more enjoyable, I think. But it doesn't stop. It carries on through the grandchildren. The founding father will continue to work through generations if you'll be the father that he's called you to be today. You must make sure that they are taught about the freedoms that you receive from your heavenly father. So they'll walk in those same freedoms. One of the greatest fears I have in our country today is that people will, will forget about the freedoms that we did have. I'm afraid, even as a history teacher, that there, and, and even as a citizen, just a citizen of the United States, that we're eliminating so much of our history that we'll forget where we came from. Right. Yeah, it's not all good. We need to know the bad. That's right. So we don't go back. That's right. Our children need to know what we've gone through. Our children need to hear our testimonies. Our children need to know how God has delivered us out. Our children need to know the freedom that we've been through. Proverbs 17, 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Fathers, today I want to close with that thought today. First of all, your legacy is not going to end, because your children are going to have children too. Keep working. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep serving God. Keep living for God. 
Keep asking God to change you every day and make you the father that he would have you to be. You keep doing what God has called you to do. The Bible says the glory of the children are their fathers. Your children love you, dads. They might not express that all the time either. But one day, they might not even appreciate it right now, but one day they will. They'll appreciate every, every, every discipline that you give them, every spanking you give them. They'll appreciate all the times you said no. They'll appreciate the things that you have done. And then that scripture in Psalm 128 says, A peace and give you peace upon Israel. The future of our nation depends on men who will step up now. Will they know their founding father or will they stray away? That all depends on the leadership and examples that they have in their fathers now. It all depends on you, Dad. It all depends on you, men. Are you going to be that example? Are we going to continue to live for God and draw closer to God every day because our children and our wives are depending on it? Are we just going to keep doing the same thing? Living the same way? God has called us to be strong. Yes, I'm thankful for each and every one of you. I'm thankful for what God has made me to be. But I know there's more growth to be done in me. And I think if you're honest, you would say that too. If you're a man in this house today, and you would say, hey, I need to... I need to grow as a father or a grandfather. Or I need to just grow as a man of God. It doesn't mean you've sinned. It doesn't mean you've done anything necessarily wrong. It just means you need God to help you to be strong. If that's you, would you come and just stand here today?